I am a sustainable fashion writer, podcaster, and storyteller from um, Cape Town, South Africa. And today I feel so honored to be able to spend some time with an incredible panel of cultural sustainability change makers as part of Cultural Intellectual Property Month this year. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with this month, um, Cultural IP Month 2023 is an initiative by the Cultural Intellectual Property Rights Initiative, or SIPRI, as you'll probably hear me referring to them and in the rest of the conversation. And it's really a month long celebration of the creativity, the wisdom, um, the innovation um, of the indigenous people, ethnic groups and local communities, um, and also an advocacy for collect collective custodianship rights. Uh, and this theme for this month this year is cultural IP rights are human rights. And we'll be unpacking this much further in the conversation. Um, but really, the purpose of the month is to generate a space for conversation, to be a catalyst for systems change, and to advocate for a new generation of rights and acknowledge Indigenous people, ethnic groups, and local communities' self determination and collective rights to protect their traditional knowledge, um, their traditional cultural expressions, and their governance systems and worldviews. And it's a labor of love. <laughs> it's a big month long gift to the international community of thinkers, creators, craft custodians, and anyone with an open heart and soul to start this mind shift revolution, which we desperately need. So yes, I guess to center this conversation and just ground the topic for today, um, I come from um, a background in the fashion industry. And for me, fashion is the lens through which I understand systems change. And this conversation around cultural sustainability could not be more relevant or more urgent in the fashion industry, which is known to be a copycat industry and for its endless um, commercial exploitation of cultural expressions. So at the same time um, as this kind of copycat and the intellectual property theft is happening, I've also noticed that cultural sustainability has become a new buzzword in the industry. Um, but unfortunately with its rise in popularity, it's often misunderstood. And that's really where the inspiration for today's conversation came from. Because I really believe that if it's approached holistically, um, fashion can and should be part of a different narrative. One that sees artisan communities as knowledge partners and that promotes culture and also ensures the preservation of generational skills. And that's exactly what we're going to be diving into today to unpack what a fashion ecosystem with cultural sustainability at its core will look like and practically what steps we can take to get there. Um, yes, and that is enough about me um, and the panel. I am honored today to be joined by Monica um, Nicole Crouch, Umeshwari Palmer, and Ria Kearney. And they are all um, committed to such deeply textured work in the space and I think that they're all best introduced in their own words so I'm going to pass on to the panelists um, and ask you each if you could briefly introduce yourself and what you do as a cultural sustainability change maker and then also maybe briefly in the moment that you realize that fashion needs to engage deeply with cultural sustainability. Um, Monica would you like to start us off? Absolutely. Thank you, Stella, for the question. Um, cultural sustainability um, was, a, was a new space I, I discovered um, in my journey as a lawyer, uh, in my journey to, to learn about um, collective rights, collective custodianship rights, and how can we co-create a system that nurtures, sustains, and protects traditional knowledge and traditional uh, cultural expressions in partnership with indigenous peoples, ethnic groups, and local communities. So through this journey, I, um, I got to meet a few examples in the fashion industry where these partnerships did not exist uh, at all. And um, that was uh, a point where um, um, I was also now interested in, in how the, the system operates. So I was already in Sweden at this time, uh, doing a master's degree after my law degree uh, in textile value chain management in a, in a university that is a leading university in sustainability in fashion. Um, so I was having conversations um, based on my area of interest, and, and I discovered that there is a fourth pillar of 
sustainability that people know about, and it had been part of many discussions and debate throughout time, that is cultural sustainability. And I, then I, I try to understand what does cultural sustainability mean from my perspective as a legal practitioner that um, has a decided to take this path uh, and, and work together with indigenous peoples, ethnic groups and local communities. Um, and so for me, I realized that fashion um, uh, as a system cannot continue to claim to work towards sustainability without uh, acknowledging and understanding um, the importance of cultural sustainability and unpacking this concept in a way that is inclusive and representative of the realities around us. So um, not, not reducing the concept to, let's say, only using crafts uh, in creating fashion without any kind of consideration to the ecosystem of uh, where the craft exists, who is the custodian, how, what is the meaning of, of the craft. And, and then throughout my, my journey that started in 2018, with our first cultural sustainability in fashion workshop at the Swedish School of Textiles in Borås. Throughout that journey, um, there were layers and layers and layers of discovery. Um, and, and the essence of the, <laughs> of the layers is this idea of, of rights, collective rights. So, so whenever we speak about cultural sustainability in the context of the Cultural Intellectual Property Rights Initiative and all the projects that we've developed together with um, some of the members in the panel, <laughs> all of the members in the panel, um, um, we, we have this idea of collective rights um, in the back of our head. It's a premise. It's not um, an additional desirable element. It is the premise of all the conversations we have. Amazing. And we're definitely going to be unpacking that idea of collective rights further a little bit later. Um, I'll pass on to Nicole. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, Hi everyone, thanks for joining. My name is Nicole Crouch and I am from Sydney, Australia. Uh, I have a background as a textile print designer in the commercial fashion industry, which is creating the digital repeating artwork that gets printed onto clothes for hundreds of brands around the world. So I really, I did enjoy doing that, but for you sitting at a computer with lots of thinking time, I just knew there was something bigger that this skill could be leveraged for other than my siloed industry role. So just before the pandemic hit, I started teaching textile design at university and suddenly having to articulate uh, general fashion industry practices to a group of complete beginners, I began to question the whole fashion system. I started to feed my curiosity by listening to talks and connecting with like-minded people, um, textile artisans on social media. And this is where I came across uh, CIPRI. I'd never heard of cultural intellectual property rights or cultural sustainability. And I didn't know what they were because they're not considered in the design or education systems that I was positioned within at the time. Um, supporting cultural sustainability was a space to leverage the skills that I had for something that was more important than a design and for something for more people other than myself and my demographic. So I started to join on developing some projects with CIPRI, such as the Three Seas Get Weaving campaign, which made me realise that people with commercial fashion design skills have a really powerful part to play in supporting cultural sustainability. So from this, I am now in the middle of my PhD, which aims to rewrite the textile print design process for the commercial fashion industry to comply with cultural intellectual property rights and inspire designers to seek opportunities at specific trigger points in the creative process to authentically engage with indigenous led strategies to support cultural sustainability. So it was the influence of Australian Indigenous voices through NADOC Week, uh, personal collect connections with textile artisans and the knowledge and support of um, Cipri and Monica that saw me completely pivot my career from unknowingly culturally misappropriating in the commercial fashion industry to instead try and poke holes in the fashion industry process of which I'm an expert 
for Indigenous knowledges to come to the fore where they're currently unacknowledged and undervalued to support cultural sustainability in fashion. That's me. Thank you. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Omesh Wari, would you like to add in here? Hello, everyone. Uh, to everyone who don't know me, my name is Umeshwari Parmar. I am a CSA 2021 alumni. That makes me one of the first students of Cultural Sustainability Academy. Since then, I like to call myself as a culturally sustainable zero waste fashion designer. After working in the mainstream fashion industry for four years in New York uh, and simultaneously studying about uh, the need of cultural sustainability in fashion, I built my vision for my brand, Pitambar India, by putting all that I learned at CSA in action to be a working example of cultural sustainability agent of change. As I grew up in a traditional Indian family, uh, I was always surrounded by traditional cultural expressions and traditional knowledge in my daily lifestyle. What drew my attention was the origin of these techniques and skills that have been passed down through generations. Majority of them were designed to fulfill their day-to-day -day needs by whatever, whatever resources were available locally uh, by, the, by their land. Majority of these resources were natural resources, uh, unlike, in, unlike in today's time where uh, the fashion industry uh, focuses more on outsourcing uh, cheaper man-made, um, you know, cheaper man-made materials for cost cutting and scaling business. This very traditional approach was something that really fascinated me and was made, uh, that made me realize that fashion needs to deeply engage with cultural sustainability for a more efficient and a conscious design approach. Amazing, and I think, yeah, I have so many questions for you on how you've um, incorporated your learnings into the Tambar as well. Um, but Ria, would you like to do an intro before we get into the conversation? Sure, thanks Stella. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Ria Kearney. I'm currently based in Ireland where I grew up, um, but I spent many years living, studying, working abroad um, in different countries um, with different organizations. And um, I've worked in the field of sustainability for around 15 or 16 years now. And the last 10 of those have been primarily focused on the global apparel sector. Um, and I've worked in a range of in-house roles as well as uh, consultancy-based roles. And my current role is with a global sustainability consultancy called Anthesis Group. Um, so for me, in terms of, I suppose, in terms of being a change in, change agent for cultural sustainability I think for me I'm right at the beginning of that journey and that, that kind of that learning process um so it's very much a work in progress and I think becoming um part of the CSA is obviously you know it's key to that and it's been kind of a really important sort of milestone for me um and I think because I am right at the beginning I suppose what I can do in the meantime what I'm trying to to focus on now that I'm more committed um, to getting more immersed in this kind of this this much kind of broader topic is to really be an ambassador for what they do um, an ambassador for CIPRI, an ally to CIPRI and the CSA, but also really just trying to advocate for cultural sustainability in my professional life, um, but also, you know, personally. Um, and I think for me, it's not been one kind of very specific moment of realization that the, the fashion industry needs to engage in this, but more that gradual realization that the more I've worked in this field, the more um, companies, brands, retailers that I've worked with, it is largely missing from the mainstream sustainability debate and from strategies and from the agenda, from initiatives. Um, so whilst from a personal perspective, I've always been drawn to these facets from a very, very young age, it's really been over here. And then professionally speaking, as I say, it's just really largely missing. I feel like within the mainstream context, certainly and generally speaking, the vast majority are still grappling with, with let's say issues that fall under the other three pillars with, with very little regard or, or awareness of this fourth pillar around cultural sustainability. So I think the need, the need for a fashion industry in general to engage is massive. And also I think what's really interesting is it's not just that need, but kind of the benefit and kind of the opportunity and the potential there for the fashion sector is massive. So that's, it's really exciting to kind of be at the beginning of this kind of emerging, emerging sort of topic and process. 
Amazing. Yeah, I think that's such a, an important perspective. Um, and also, I think I love how each of your backgrounds are different, but so complementary to each other's um, expertise and interests um, and just dedication. So yeah, I'm sure that everybody watching can just tell that the base of expertise we have on this panel is going to provide a very, very uh, interesting conversation. And I think to, to frame it, I wanted to ask you, Monica, first to really define how SAPRI um, understands and defines cultural sustainability, because as I mentioned in the intro, it's definitely a term I've been seeing coming up more and more over the past few years. Um, but I have also noticed and got the sense that it's misunderstood. So just to set the record clear as we enter this conversation, would you mind um, yeah, just defining for us what your take on it is? Um, when we started uh, working with this term um, uh, and we, we um, localized our impact um, between the fashion and the legal systems, because those were the first two systems uh, that I had um, expertise in or I was creating crafting expertise in, we refer to it as um, so connected to the idea of the transmission of knowledge from generation to generation, an idea that is essential, and it's uh, it's the the let's say the core um, and the substance of traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. They are kept alive. They are alive. They are living, and they are transmitted from generation to generation in different ways um, and depending on different communities and their customary laws and their governance systems and so on. So starting from that point, um, around 2018, we were saying cultural sustainability in fashion means ensuring that um, the fashion industry is engaged in transmitting traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions to future generations. But we never for a moment um, wanted that definition to be um, understood in, in, in void or, or taken literally just, you know, um, doing that by any means. So the basis, like I was saying in the introduction, the premise was the respect of the coll collective custodianship rights of the custodians of traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions who are indigenous peoples, ethnic groups, local communities, and the members um, of, of these communities. Um, so in diversity integration is part of this way, of this holistic way of looking at cultural sustainability. Um, and, and we noticed that um, different actors in the ecosystems, um, in, in the ecosystem took part of the idea and then started working on it, but not always connecting this whole, um, uh, all the ingredients. So collective rights are important. And sometimes we cannot uh, identify exactly who is the right holder, who's the community. But this means that we need more dialogues. We need more engagement in uh, understanding who is the community and how do we work with collectives in general. Um, so um, not not being um, caught in that um, paradigm of private property, private ownership, individual over the ecosystem, but thinking as a community. And this is what we also tried to do in the Cultural Sustainability Academy. We are a community. We are a family we are not competing, alumni are not competing against each other, we're all working uh, towards uh, like going together as a collective in, in the same direction. We are not an indigenous community, we're not an ethnic group, we're not a local community, but we are a community that is connected by a vision uh, to promote and sustain cultural sustainability, um, and, and we strive towards um, applying this rights-based approach. We don't have all the answers yet, but we are uh, learning and discovering uh, different actions and tools together. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's an important point because everybody needs to have like that openness to learn together. Um, and as you were saying, there's not going to be a one size fits all. This is exactly how you approach and apply these concepts and frameworks. Um, and it is that care and that approach to wanting to learn that's going to make the biggest difference. Um, and I think I was reminded as you were speaking, Monica, about Nicole, your work with 
power redistribution um, as you were speaking about uh, textile print design um, and also what you noticed, I guess, in the commercial fashion space. And hearing Monica speak about this collective custodianship, um, yeah, reminded me that there is this hierarchy and these power dynamics that are at play um, and really affect the way we see cultural sustainability and how fashion approaches it. Um, so I was wondering if you could just share from your perspective what fashion most often gets wrong when it comes to cultural sustainability and then what the issue is, because I've seen it mostly used in, in marketing um, when I feel like it's used incorrectly or used to misappropriate. Um, so what is the danger? What is the issue with using cultural sustain sustainability within marketing without this deeper engagement? Yes, thank you. Uh, big question. Um, I think what the fashion industry um, often gets wrong when it comes to cultural sustainability is that they look at it through a fashion lens and consider how cultural sustainability can be adapted to a fashion context. However, the fashion industry needs to adapt to what different communities consider cultural sustainability means for them. So it's a concept that it's not currently embedded in commercial fashion industry processes at a wide scale. Um, so it's generally a completely new topic and mindset for a lot of commercial fashion industry practitioners. Also, as cultural sustainability is very complex and deep and different for each community, it can seem beyond the scope of individual fashion industry roles to learn about and take on the responsibility for engaging with it. Um, so this issue uh, then leads to some fashion brands attempting to engage uh, with artists and communities uh, with the motivation um, of having a competitive advantage within the structure of the current fashion industry system, which maintains that um, unbalanced designer producer dynamic. So for cultural sustainability to be authentically engaged with the fashion industry, um, in the fashion industry, the structures of the current fashion industry system where designers design and artisans produce needs to be majorly challenged. So complying with cultural sustainability is not like a checklist or the production of a small seasonal collection or project based on a trend or an interest. It's an educational process which develops a lens through which traditional knowledge is respected and informs actions. And either from that, long-term relationships with mutual benefit sharing are developed or communities who do not want to partner with the fashion industry are respected through the right to the exclusive use of their own intellectual expressions for their own benefit and are viewed um, at an expert status. So quite often fashion industry can initiate collaborations with artists and communities with um, a savior attitude and a predetermined product um, as predetermined product outcome um, as the main priority. So cultural sustainability means acknowledging um, the textiles of artists and communities do not need intervention from the commercial fashion industry to be considered valid collections. They are valid collections on their own. And many communities have been creating you know, fully traceable, sustainable, like any, um, you know, industry buzzword you can think of, textiles for centuries. And just because the commercial fashion industry is trying it, it doesn't mean that it's new or suddenly valid. And the industry often thinks of itself as separate and above artisan and artistic textile practices, which is one of the barriers to bringing that traditional knowledge to the fore within the context of the commercial industry. And so thinking that cultural sustainability is simply preserving a skill or a technique is often where the depth to the importance of cultural sustainability is not understood or demonstrated by the fashion industry um, in their marketing narratives, because marketing narratives are often originally even disconnected from the product. Like I've designed prints um, you know, at, late at night on a hustle on a Thursday before the deadline. And I see them in stores with, you know, this will make you feel like you're on an island in Greece. And I'm like, this is disconnected from my creation of this. Um, so marketing is a, a tool of disconnection from an industrial product to a story. 
um, and this confuses consumers who are not experts on the topic, but have the power to determine the success of a fashion brand based on these stories. So brands dictate rhythms to consumers and dictate the allocation of the earth's natural resources based on their design decisions that often have aesthetics as their core value. So fashion brands do have a huge responsibility and massive opportunity to impact cultural sustainability um, through their creative decisions and through their marketing. Yeah, that, that made so much sense. And I also wanted to say that if any of the other panelists have things they want to add onto a comment or something that the previous panelists have said, please just put up your hand or, or uh, open your mic because I want this to be, um, yeah, a collaborative uh, space as well. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that I love the way you explain those power dynamics and also as fed into what Monica was saying about, it's not about cultural sustainability at all costs, you know, it's really about reciprocity and that word kept coming up while I was listening to you um, talking and just how <laughs> we need to rethink the roles and the power dynamics that come with those roles in the fashion industry and designers are not uh, above everybody else so you're also a facilitator and you're also um, a learner and you're somebody that has the capacity to um, be taught and engage in different ways of, of um, fashioning and I think that yeah, Umeshwari, I want to ask you more about Sikambar because I know that you are working with these frameworks and um, in practice, you know, with your hand weavers and, and what you're doing with Sikambar. So yeah, could you speak a bit more about the connection between cultural sustainability and human rights in your work and also what you've noticed the sociocultural, sociocultural value of craftsmanship and craft innovation to be? Uh my uh my brand pitambar india is uh, not a mainstream fashion brand it's about unlearning the conventional design practices and redefining the definition of design it follows a culturally sustainable zero waste design approach uh, by re-exploring ancient garment making techniques which were practiced pre-industrialization when textile was only produced through hand weaving due to which it was of high value and was considered precious worldwide Pitambar aims to reintroduce those age-old practices with collaboration with hand weavers in India by following an unconventional design process where our zero-waste garment patterns are derived from the width and length of a hand-woven textile for a more conscious and mindful design designing. And that's that's why it's a it's a very slow fashion brand. Uh, Pitambar derives its connection uh, between cultural sustainability and human rights from the most important point that I learned at CSA, that is to ensure that traditional skills are passed down to the future generations in a right manner without exploitation of their ways of working. What I have learned through my one year of working with hand weavers in India is that though they have, been, they have managed to pass down their skills through generations, they have been forced to leave behind their sustainable uh, ways of, of, you know, sustainable practices, sustainable ways of working to be more relevant to the demands of the industry and the market. In this journey of sustaining uh, their skills and being relevant, the artisans have been using very cheap and harmful raw materials like synthetic materials, acid dyes, which are polluting the, their lands and the most affected ones are they themselves. Therefore, unfortunately, making handicraft and handloom sector in India one of the most polluted industries in the country. Uh, at Pitambar, we make sure we do not exploit our artisans' basic human right to practice their environmentally sustainable ways of working for their well-being. And we co-design to come up with products that are authentic, following DC's CIPRI's 3C's rule of consent credit and compensation with no space for terms like social washing and green washing. There is a Sanskrit phrase, Vasudevai Kutumbakam, which literally means the world is one family. I regard this kind of collectivism as the fundamental socio cultural value for craftsmanship and craft innovation. 
Monica, would you like to add something? I would like to say I'm, I'm very inspired to, um, by the example of uh, Umeshwari. And um, I think in the past year, I've, I've had the chance to work with a few more uh, design practitioner in, in their early stages of their career uh, to, to create a space for, for vulnerability uh, where, where we acknowledge together how difficult it is to reintroduce practices like Umeshwari is saying to relearn like the really the understanding of what's slow fashion it's very slow it's very challenging it's really um taking people outside of their comfort zones um so it's a it's a it's a project and a process that involves both sides in a way so the artisans they have suffered a lot in the process of industrialization and there's that is clear um, and it's important it's so important to, now that designers come and are ready to change their approach not that they are ready to change that they come with a new outlook on um, knowledge partnership and collaborative processes um, and what I saw which is amazing is that artisans are ready and patient to engage in these collaborations, despite all the systematic injustice and suffering that they have been subjected to, in a way. Um, and um, um, in a research we did in 2020 um, in India, um, we referred to these age-old practices that are inherently sustainable, especially in the context of India, as culturally embedded sustainability practices. And I say especially in the context of India, because there are so many um, uh, sayings and words and concepts in Sanskrit that are talking, that are defining cultural sustainability. This is, it's a worldview. Um, so we use the term cultural sustainability, but if you learn Sanskrit, you would know how to practice what we all want to practice here. Um, and there, you don't need a word for that. You don't need to call it sustainability or cultural sustainability. So when you come to, to people uh, in this territory and you tell them you need to be sustainable because that's what the fashion industry is striving for, of course, there is an outcry and... Uh, um, you know, saying, why isn't our knowledge valuable enough? Because we've been practicing this for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, and so it's important to look back at the practices that are connected to place, to geography, um, to ancestors, um, and, and those practices, bringing them back into relevance, um, if, if that's a choice of words that <laughs> it's a good choice of words um so to 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 see the value of those practices and why they have sustained for so long not because there wasn't a cheaper alternative but because the multifaceted value it brought to people's lives and to to nurturing their connection with everything around to be present and not dissociated Nicole was also mentioning dissociation so that dissociation mm -hmm is also alienating us as people. And of course, the emotional connection with our garments is zero when we are completely alien um, from what textile means in, you know, in your personal life. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, to be in these spaces and also for me to be in the sustainable fashion movement space is to acknowledge that it's not a new concept, you know, and and to ignore and to move forward without that, that acknowledgement and deep engagement is a huge disservice. Um, and yeah, I think that that is what I, when I first joined the space, was worried that it was lacking. You know, people were acting like uh, these eco-friendly practices were just something new, like it's just popped up in people's lives. And if you look further back, um, and not even that further back, like if you just talk to people, <laughs> you will realize that uh, there's so much um, richness and story and heritage behind um, all of these uh, yeah, conversations that we're having now. And it feels like, as I was saying, buzzwords, but there's so much depth to them. Um, and as you were saying, Monica, as well, um, these concepts are deeply embedded within indigenous communities and there are ways of being and ways of looking at the world. Um, and language is obviously important because we kind of, we can use language to divide ourselves, but we can also use it to unite different um, cultures and traditions. Um, 
Ria, I'm really interested in this from your perspective because, you know, in I guess in the more corporate fashion world and also on a more macro scale, it doesn't feel as though these words and practices are as deeply embedded. Um, and I know you've worked in a number of organizations and also larger companies. Um, so yes, I was wondering if you could share a bit more about your experience with advocating for um, change and getting larger companies and corporations to engage with cultural sustainability, especially as you also mentioned in your introduction, um, when it's a new concept uh, to them as well. Sure. Um... So yeah, you're absolutely right. I think for I think for them, let's say generally speaking, as we kind of look at it from that mainstream um, fashion perspective, mainstream sustainability sector perspective, um, it is a new concept for them. Um, so as you're explaining, Monica, not a new concept, but a concept that needs to be newly introduced uh, to them. Um, I think for me, because it's also new to me coming at it as it's been framed as CIPRI and as CSA, it's really what comes next for me in terms of, okay, how do I and we as a collective start to engage on this concept? And I think it's what I've been thinking a lot about since uh, going through the academy um, with this group. And I think for me, there's, there's I suppose, two, two initial things that I've been thinking a lot about. And again, coming at it from that mainstream perspective, and given that there's, there's so many other things that are being um, grappled with and tackled in terms of different issues. I think one is because cultural sustainability in its broadest sense, with all the different facets that fall under that, it's it's very complex, it's very multi, multi-layered, it's, there's, there's, it's very interconnected. I think what's going to be key is finding ways to make that accessible um, to mainstream players at, at, at an individual level, but also at the organizational level. Um, so how we as a group make it accessible, what are the ways that we can enable them to engage in the in the subject and in these different kind of, let's say, subtopics in ways that are practical, tangible, very meaningful, um, and also showing them the value in doing so. So I think that's one thing. Um, the second thing for me is being able to demonstrate how there are so many interconnections and so many cross-cutting themes and topics that they're really not, and again, generally speaking, starting from scratch, that a lot of what is being done perhaps already from a social perspective, environmental perspective, when we think about those pillars and the different topics that fall under those pillars, there are different things happening there that can actually relate to and link to cultural sustainability. So I think being able to demonstrate that is gonna be really, really important as well. You know, organizations, whether the brand, retailer, whatever level we wanna say, they are not necessarily starting from scratch. There is a lot there already. And as we start to look at what is happening out there, there is a lot there. It's just perhaps that we're not in a position of naming it cultural sustainability or talking about it in these terms and with the terminology that is um, you know, being really developed and, and pushed through the likes of, of CIPRI. I think the other thing is that to your point, Nicole, it's, it's also not about one collection or like one collection per season or these tiny little bits that is very fragmented which is perhaps what we do see generally speaking um from the mainstream but how how we enable organizations brands retailers to take a step back and think about it from that kind of whole organization perspective whole supply chain perspective whole design process perspective so it's something that starts to really seep through you know the organization or the entire business model and um, so obviously a, a very long term let's say vision, mission, goal, or kind of work um, to be done. But I think being able to, as I say, break it down and find those those entry points and those starting points to make it something that is possible, I think that's going to be really key in terms of getting larger corporations to be able to engage in the topic. Definitely. Monica, would you like to come in? I was again inspired <laughs> by Maria's intervention, um, as I was by Umeshvari. And I wanted uh, just to to um, to maybe say that um, what is powerful and what we also see in our community is that um, the transformation um, to the mind shift transformation and uh, the um, um, connection or the desire to be an agent of change for cultural sustainability is is in all cases. Um, intimately connected with the person it comes from within in every case it it went through a personal experience it's not going to be a strategy that a company can um can create as a business plan before first 
feeling that comfort that that transformation personally in different teams in different in different boards in executive rooms and so on we we have to go through this process um to see what it feels like um to to have this immersiveness for this transformation to be possible it is a very long-term mission uh in that sense like ria was saying definitely and uh, that's why we created the Cultural Sustainability Academy, the executive program um, of it, the executive branch to have those meetings and go through these transformations together and see, you know, how they reflect in different individuals experience. And this year we're doing the first academy face to face in the heart of Transylvania. So that's an excellent opportunity for those who are attracted by the idea um to to try and experience what does cultural sustainability mean to you individually um going through or or experiencing it in um in this safe space um with with others that have also um started this this journey um if uh and, and learning from people who live it on a day-to-day -day basis um who are indigenous peoples ethnic groups and local communities that that's a goal like to to be together with those um th those experts at living and practicing cultural sustainability and again we use a term that to them is lifestyle and the worldview it's not a term in, in that sense but we always have to um uh, i'd like to always do these these translations and i think it's important for us to acknowledge these translations and use them every now and then yes in different contexts we might not translate so much but in this space it's good to acknowledge that we must translate some and have patience with each other that uh, uh, slowly by using terms that we all understand um we can we can really act on those changes that we want to see implemented i agree and i think as you were saying we speak about companies or corporations in the abstract sometimes and we forget that they're made up of so many different people and that the change will come from um individuals within as well um so I think I definitely want to touch more on the Cultural Sustainability Academy, but I think to just have a pause here, Monica, I just wanted to ask you to briefly um, share the connection between cultural sustainability um, and how it's implicitly embedded in cultural intellectual property rights, because I know we've been now also using these terms um, in unison during this conversation, and I just want people to be able to understand the deep connection between that, and then I want to chat more about the learnings from the Academy, so yeah. I wish I had um, the perfect words to express this very important connection. Sometimes I, I don't have the best words, um, but in collectives, in communities that are that function as a as one, although are, they are made up by different individuals, where this ecosystemic uh, mind view is present collective rights and cultural sustainability are the same. They are not two silos. And it's exactly um, what we are trying to, to also um, um, advance with our community and with the different programs and projects and actions that we do. Um, they are These are not two dissociated issues. It's not the fashion industry tackles cultural sustainability and the legal system uh, um, tackles collective rights. Um, these things are always together. We have been in 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 our in our world uh, that is so connected and that has so many different systems and industries and all this that need to function. Um, we have been somehow going to law school to study law and then be lawyers or make laws. Uh, then we went to fashion schools to be fashion people. But what if you can do both? Because back in the days in these communities, there were wise people who um, were, were creating rules together with the community for the well-being of the community, for protection, for, for different um, um, purposes that the community agreed. It's better if we do like this. It's better if, you know, when there's a conflict and we can't solve it, we'd go and ask some people who might be able to support. So all these kind of customary laws, as they were called, um, and, and then you had 
people who are creating garments that represented their identity. It could be the same person that was, let's say, a, a lawyer and a designer at the same time. Um, it, those things are not exclusive. So it's it's the same with this collectives and and being able to to um, to live in collectivity um, in a way that that is supportive of each other, um, not kind of killing the goat of the other. It's something that we have uh, a saying in Romania. Um, you know, when you're when you have a mentality that oh, if it's wrong for me, it should be wrong for everyone. Like if I'm not lucky, everyone should be unlucky. It's the concept of let the goat of the neighbor die too. Um, and that's not what we want. We want, you know, if the neighbor lost his goat, then we will give him milk until he can, uh, you know, sort the situation out. So in that that type of um, uh, humanity and cohesion, we see that in indigenous communities and we see that um, at a level that is so impactful and impressive because these communities had also had to to be cohesive and resilient, to fight many other um, threats um, that were, that maybe others didn't have to. Um, and, and so this collectivity, this the power of the collective um, is important. And it should be important in the fashion industry as well to understand that it's not just the fashion makers or the companies that sell whatever, feed consumers with what they should wear. It's the whole ecosystem. Um, and it's, it's the artisans that are involved. It's all these communities of people. Um, in that sense, sometimes words fail me because it's uh, such a, a complex construction and it's so many different examples and parallels that we can make. Um, but these two aspects are the same coin. It's just how we look at it. It's easier to talk about cultural sustainability when we talk to fashion industry practitioners because sustainability is something that now is a focus. Uh, and that's the angle that's probably easier to come through then we also have to talk to the legal practitioners who are contributing to, to advocacy for, for new legal frameworks. And to them, we talk from a collective uh, custodianship right perspective. So then maybe there's a lot more other perspectives that we should also be talking from. Um, and, and it's not just collective rights and cultural sustainability. And I'm sure there, there are practitioners of, out there that will be uh, coming up with those perspectives. You know, when we talk about biodiversity, it's exactly englobing the same, uh, safeguarding the biodiversity of our planet and, and living in harmony with nature, which is the vision um, of, of the world by 2050. This requires collective rights, recognition of collective rights and understanding that if our collective rights are not respected. If you don't, uh, you know, uh, work towards them, what's going to happen? Uh, and then it's about, you know, sustaining lifestyles and practices that are good for the people, that are enriching the quality of life, that are making us more present, more conscious, more connected. Yeah, fully. I fully agree. And I think, as you're saying, it's about connecting the dots and also breaking through silos um, in multiple industries it's not going to you know the solutions are not going to be within our very narrow fields of but going to need to look outwards and inwards uh, to, to find these yeah to embrace new ways of fashioning and being in the world that is in harmony with um, natural systems and also with the people and the communities that surround all of us um, and I think yeah we've collectively also been chatting about how this is a lifelong process of learning and unlearning and um, just embracing difference and culture um, and I think that I want to talk more about the Cultural Sustainability Academy because I think it's a, a great starting point for that in a, a journey that can feel quite daunting because of how complex and because of how um, yeah there are many different ways to approach it so Nicole could you just briefly touch on um, the different pillars that the academy focuses on um, and how this kind of feeds into your mission to create um, change makers within the space. Yes, thank you. Um, well, yes, for fashion brands uh, who are, you know, and everyone else who is 
serious about learning more cultural sustainability, we have the our Cultural Sustainability Academy, which is a knowledge hub for cultural sustainability or the CSA for short. Um, so the CSA is a holistic learning experience uh, that is focused exclusively on the concept of cultural sustainability in fashion, creative industries and uh, cultural sector, which equips you with um, unique knowledge and tools to understand um, and enable cultural sustainability in your organization and project and business and, and in your life. Um, so the CSA bridges um, the knowledge gap uh, between the commercial fashion industry um, and, uh, you know, um, Indigenous communities, uh, Indigenous people, local communities and ethnic groups. Um, in supply chains from the perspective of artisans and traditional knowledge holders as right holders. Um, so the CSA is structured on five knowledge pillars um, and is modelled on group work interactions uh, amongst the cohort uh, to build networking um, and dynamic you know, multidisciplinary and transnational teams for problem solving. Um, so I'll just briefly elaborate on the knowledge pillars. So the first one is um, uh, craftsmanship and craft innovation, which will expand your knowledge of the intangible uh, values embedded in the handcrafted product and the meaning it holds beyond aesthetics. Uh, the second pillar is research and academia, where you will learn to challenge conventional learning systems and apply ecological thinking to knowledge sharing and to knowledge acquisition as well. The third pillar is design and technology, where you'll be guided through translating the design process from designing to consume and produce to designing um, to heal Mother Earth. So through practical examples, um, you're trained to identify the connections between traditional knowledge and uh, innovative technologies and see the value of that traditional knowledge in the systems that we rely on today. Um, the fourth pillar is activism and communication, um, where you discover how designing ethical actions add value to your products and services. And we go beyond um, the dichotomy of you know, cultural misappropriation versus cultural appreciation and understand the DNA of um, culturally sensitive communication like we were speaking about before with the disconnected marketing. Your action in this pillar, you, you know, designing your actions is designing your story. Um, and the fifth pillar is law and cultural heritage where we unpack um, complex legal terminology to familiarize you with the difference between the way um, like WIPO and, or the World Intellectual Property Organization and UNESCO protect cultural heritage. And so we'll be able to identify the gaps in this protection so that um, you can develop your own tools for ethical practice that bridge those gaps. Um, so in um, 2021 and 2022, the CSA was structured um, by delivering each pillar in a three hour session, which was hosted over six weeks, uh, which included an opening ceremony to get to know everyone and a closing ceremony sometime later uh, to provide the cohort with an opportunity to reflect um, on the knowledge and any knowledge gained. Um, so this year, like Monica mentioned, we have a face-to-face -face immersive CSA experience being hosted in Romania in October. Um, and we also have custom corporate packages for companies uh, to be delivered internally as well, um, fully customizable. So the CSA is suitable for decision-making professionals who want to be innovative leaders in their industry, um, for passionate advocates, for ethical standards across a variety of industries um, whose activities impact on people in the planet. Um, and for people with altruistic mindsets who want to bring together um, philanthropy and creativity with business decisions and impact. Um, so, sorry, I just I really need to sneeze and I'm like, my I've got tears running down my face. Um, so the 
um, the pathway um, to comply with cultural intellectual property rights for cultural sustainability is to be um, flexible to embrace being led by the traditional knowledge and perspectives of Indigenous communities, which is determined by and different from community to community and challenges those conventional commercial fashion industry supply chain systems. And this is why understanding cultural sustainability is beyond learning a technical process. It's a whole shift in mindset, which requires the depth of the CSA and continued exploration and actioning of resulting curiosities, uh, networking and forming dynamic partnerships like we have here with our cohort um, to be successfully implemented into practice. Amazing. And yeah, as you mentioned, we're very lucky to have two alumni here today. Um, Meshwari, would you like to just expand on your experience um, of the academy and also yeah, what it taught you about moving away from culture as a commodity and moving towards culture as a medium for co-creation in fashion. Um, and I know that a lot of these learnings are involved in your work at Pitambar. And so could you just yeah explain about what this has meant in practice for you? Sure. Uh, CSA gave me a whole new understanding to look at culture for more than just visual aesthetic to be used as an accommodity. Uh, instead, it taught me that there is a treasure trove of knowledge if you put in some effort to find the answer to the why, what, who, when, and how. These questions, if asked, followed by the three C's rule, then culture has so much to offer as a medium of co-creation um, to craft a better future in fashion, but also not just limited to fashion, but in any industry. At Petambar, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions are an integral part of my design process. They help us unlearn the conventional design practices and introduces us to an alternative and a more efficient design solutions, which are tried and tested for centuries. Though a traditional uh, approach is a uh, design approach is, a, is slow and cannot be understood by the fast fashion industry. It's almost like working in a parallel universe. Uh, it's been one year of learning from failures and challenges of being a sustainable fashion brand in today's world. I had to make peace with the fact that things are not going to work in a pace I'm expecting it to, and one cannot expect instant results. Also, one has to understand that craftsmanship and craft innovation is not just the only thing you are working on. Though it may be an integral part of your brand, there is so much more you, you are working on, like trying to trace down your supply chain uh, to be able to give that transparency one expects from a sustainable brand. There, there is also questions of time and financial investments that you are putting in a business that might not give you results for a long time as it's not a conventional mainstream fashion brand. In the past one year of putting my vision of Pitambar into action, for time and again, I was at a tipping point, hanging by a thread and I felt lost. Uh, at those moments, I couldn't help but think about what Monica told me during my CSA days uh, when Pitambar was just a theory. She said, you need so much more than just passion to do what we are doing. I might not have understood what she really meant that time, but today I can feel it in my bones. So uh, it's, it's been a great journey and, and so far uh, I've learned a lot and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, what the coming year has in store for my uh, journey of design. That was so beautiful and I think I love that you have positioned it as this journey because I really feel deeply that that is what it is for each yeah, each person on the planet, I hope, um, regardless of whether you're in fashion or not in fashion, um, it requires that curiosity and the approach of seeing it as a journey for us to really collectively move towards um, this vision. And yeah, Ria, I wanted to ask you as well, because you're also an alumna, and we have been talking a lot about reimagining collective custodianship. Um, and you've also mentioned that you are kind of on, at the beginning of your journey, which I feel like I am as well, but happily so. Um, 
I was wondering if you could share a few of your biggest learnings from the academy and then also maybe how you've implemented these in your work, but also where you'd advise others begin um, if other people are also at the beginning of their journey. My, I have a five month old son who is, um, he's woken up and I had, um, had some childcare until midday. So he, uh, let's see if he stays quiet, but we always, we always just say within our academy, he's the first CSA baby. So maybe it's very appropriate that he is, he is on my lap. He may have something to contribute. Let's see, um, we'll see how he goes. Um, so yes, I think for me, I suppose the first thing to say is the course is um, it's incredibly comprehensive. Um, it's such a robust foundation, um, you know, an introduction into the topic. So for me, there's many, many learnings, which I'm continuing to reflect on, look back on, you know, think about. Um, but I suppose at a very high level, a couple that I could mention, I think one is certainly um, high how through the course you're able to start to join the dots across the different pillars and all those kind of different facets. Um, so Nicole's already touched on how, how it is structured. Um, so I think that coming to the topic newly, it's very, very valuable to be able to, to look at it from all those different angles, those different perspectives, those different lenses, um, and also take that kind of step back and look at it in the round almost. So as we kind of come to the end of the, the program, you sort of can see how you've come full circle and you get that really clear view of how all those dots join um, across what's you know such a multi-layer, multifaceted um, topic in itself. Um, and I think the other thing I would say in terms of a learning, which just kept coming up again and again through through the throughout the, the course is um, how cultural sustainability is not static. It is not, you know, it's not homogenous, it's not static, it's not something that we talk about solely in terms of being of preservation or saving, um, but it's something that is incredibly dynamic. It's evolving all the time, it's changing all the time. Um, so of course, I suppose that adds to the complexity of it all in terms of understanding it, but it also what makes it incredibly exciting, incredibly fascinating um, to, to get involved in. Um, and I think for me, that realization that yes, we talk about a fourth pillar, but in fact, cultural sustainability, it's really, you could say almost like the foundation of the soil for, for the other three pillars, or I quite often think of it as, it's almost that circle that en envelops the other three. It's, it's really, it, it's everything and it's all around us. So I think those were a couple of the bigger kind of higher level learnings, which kept kind of coming up again and again. Um, and sorry, you asked me another question. Yes, um, how no, to get I started. Yes. Um, how to get started. Um, I, this might sound very kind of simple, but it's really just getting started. It's sort of like, for me, it was, um, I think I mentioned at the beginning, I've always been drawn to so many of these different facets in my personal life, both my own family and my kind of heritage here in Ireland, but also tra having traveled so much. So there's a natural inc inclination to it all. And when I think about what I would be drawn to in terms of what I read and who I follow and what I want to wear, all, all those sort of things, it's there. Um, and it's really just getting started. I think for me being able to come across um, Cipri and the CSA, it was it was really a moment of like, wow, okay, there is something here that exists that is starting to, to really articulate all of the things that I'm thinking about and to give that really solid foundation into the topic. So perhaps that's the place to start, is to start with the CSA and then go from there. Um, and I often said throughout the course, um, as the team will know, it just is so overwhelming. I feel like I'm right at the beginning. Um, and they would often say, is how it is like it's a process where you continue to learn they're still learning no one is necessarily an expert because it is such a vast topic and you will you will um you know really get involved and organically be able to kind of um yeah um continue to, to you know to learn and, and to to be part of you know cultural sustainability so yeah i think it's definitely worthwhile getting started and to start with csa is a good is a very good starting point i love that and I have one more question that I want to do around um, and ask all the panelists, but I also wanted to remind people if they do have any questions for the different panelists to put them in the chat. I don't see any at the moment, but you have a few moments now while we cover the last question to um, add those if you want to. And also to ask the panelists if there's anything that you feel like you wanted to add a bit more on or we haven't had a chance to cover yet. Um, do, do any of you want to jump in and say anything? Otherwise, I'll go on to the last question. You can let me know. Is everybody good? Okay. 
Awesome. Well, then I have a last question that I want to ask everybody, um, which, yeah, I think will be the closing closing question. Um, but maybe I can add one more part to it, just because we this this panel is about um, unpacking the nuance, but it's also about leaving with a sense of um, hope and curiosity and also practicality. So. My question is, what would a fashion system with cultural sustainability at its core look like to you? And then what is the first step? If you could give somebody the first step, and I know we've mentioned the Cultural Sustainability Academy, which I think is amazing. If you could give somebody just like the first steps that they could take after leaving this panel, what would it be in their own lives? Something that you um, found useful. Um, it could be a article, a book, a person, anything, just one small step. So what, would a fashion system with cultural sustainability at its core look like? And what is your first step for, for attending? Um, yeah, I'm not sure we start with this. Umeshwari, well, would you like to start? Uh, I feel a fashion system with cultural sustainability at its core uh, would look like a whole new world of fashion where uh, different cultures will be celebrated on a global platform. And fashion brands from different origins uh, will have their unique identities uh, through their clothing. And I feel the only way to start is to just take action in what you believe in. Your feet might tremble, you'll, you'll have tears, you'll be so overwhelmed, but the only way you can start is just take action. I, that's that's what I feel. Yes, and to uh, build upon that, um, I would say the very first step for, I mean, from my experience for fashion industry practitioners to start to understand the concept of cultural sustainability beyond capitalistic goals, fashion industry aesthetics and technical execution, um, Cultural sustainability, like it enables environmental and social sustainability and economic equality through traditional and indigenous methods of working in harmony with nature. So I would suggest find something in the world that you are passionate about, that you want to have a positive impact on. It could be anything um, because it is almost certain there is a way to address that through prioritizing cultural sustainability and start with that um, because if you're passionate about it you'll pursue it and you'll do a good job at it so don't look for solutions to the outcome of a problem look at what is causing a problem in the first place and address it at the root cause um, and that can often be found in the creative process um, which many fashion industry practitioners have the authority to control. Um, and so that should be your inspiration rather than an industrial item or a disposable commodity. That's a great, great first step. <laughs> um, Ria, would you like to go? Sure. Um, I would agree with Amishwari that I think... Um, I think it would be a whole new world, a whole new system. Um, I think with cultural sustainability at its core, I really think it would open up a whole new way or multiple new ways of designing, um, creating, producing, sourcing, consuming. So I think it would really be a system that on the one hand is much more energized, much more dynamic. And yet I suppose the flip side of that is, is perhaps a system that also is slower. Um, in parts or in ways, um, unnecessarily so. Um, I think it would be a system that is much, much more equitable um, and much more collaborative in the truest sense of the word. You know, it's it's another one of the buzzwords in the industry at the minute, but I think it would be much more collabor collaborative um, in the real truest sense and kind of that equal exchange um, across, you know, multiple partners, partnerships, stakeholders, for example. Um, so I think that ultimately it would be a system that is much, much stronger and much, much more sustainable than what it is we have today. Um, and I think as, as some of the, the other panelists chatted, I had I'd thought of a few other words you mentioned that made me think that is exactly what the system would be. It'd be much more human and there'd be much more emotional connection. So the, the items, um, let's say fashion items 
craft items that are produced to be inherently more valued and valuable because of those emotional connections. So um, yeah, for me, it's a system that would be an incredible you know, fashion sector to be a part of, for sure. Um, and in terms of, oh, sorry, he wants my headphones. Um, in terms of getting started, I know I have mentioned the CSA. I think for me, I was thinking, as you said that Stella, maybe it's just a, a very simple first step of in your own home, just having a look at kind of what is around you that actually makes you start to think or almost like pull that thread of cultural sustainability. So are there items in your own home that are either you've bought on your travels or have been handed down or family heirlooms or what is it that's around you that kind of starts to open up um, some of those conversations or relates to some of the pillars that we would have touched on in the CSA. Um, I think that might be an interesting place to start because I do, I think it's, it's, it is around us in many, many more ways than perhaps we, we first realize about so starting at home and, and, and to Monica's point it has to start with the individual anyway, maybe that is a, a good place to start. Definitely, I think it is definitely about looking inward so we can also reflect and understand outwardly as well. Um, Monica, would you like to end us off? Um, I think in a way what I imagine combines uh, a bit of everything that was said so far, but it takes me back to your contribution to your article to to for the cultural IP month 2023. I think um, a world a new world with cultural sustainability would heal us as humanity. Um, and it it's quite powerful and emotional to say that because I think it would heal us as people and it would heal our planet. And it's not uh, just a utopic or, or um, um, a romantic idea. It is a possible idea. We have all the tools we need. We need to soften some hearts and we need to reduce some egos in order to get there. Um, this would create, would get us instantly to achieve uh, even the sustainable development goals. It would reduce systemic inequalities in a way that has never been seen before. It would reduce poverty worldwide because we know that indigenous peoples, ethnic groups and local communities are um, overwhelmingly living under the poverty line in the world today. And that's because their rights, collective rights or individual rights are not respected and recognized in this ecosystem at the value at, that they should. And so a world with cultural sustainability at its core would reverse that inequity and we'd reduce, would reduce that poverty. We wouldn't need to have so much in some parts and so little. Um, so the distribution of wealth, the distribution of power, um, it's incredible what, how, how, how much happier people would be, how much um, uh, less stress and, and, and less pain there would be. Uh, and one thing that I think would be interesting, it's, it's, it builds upon what Ria was saying um, to start with, is one piece of clothing or one garment or one textile uh, and learning about the story of that textile, even if it's not a traditional one, write your stories. I think I was in the last year or, or maybe the third year of university when I had my first like idea of how to connect with our clothes and I started realizing this disconnect. So we created a, I created a project that was called the Redress came from read the dress. So I convinced one of my, um, one of my now best friends uh, to join me in this. And I said, let's uh, sell all the clothes that we don't use, but we have to write the story of each piece of clothing. And that became a very painful exercise because we were realizing there's many of them that we don't have a story for, or that we don't even know if we wore them and when and why, <laughs> why did we buy them in the first place? And why I'm coming to this is because this exercise of just um, makes you realize what, what a profound and intimate connection is between a garment that somebody has made with their own sweat, with their own pain, with their own imagination, with their own limited or uh, resources. What does this story of a 60 year old blouse mean? Uh, I, I might not know, I don't know even half of it because I got it uh, passed on from someone to someone else so the the woman that embroidered it that made it you know her story 
whenever they come to my house, my neighbors, um, they, they, they are not part of these panels. They don't speak English. We are living in a rural community here um, in Petran, uh, Bihor County, Romania. And they see this vest. And this is something that everyone loves and appreciates and they identify because in our region, um, this is something that, that girls, young girls would have. Um, and so they are elderly now and they, they wouldn't wear them or they maybe lost them or they, they gave them away at some point and they come and say, oh, it's so beautiful and it's so wonderful that you have it and how you put it there, you know, to be proud of it. Um, so that's also something that um, that even in, you know, um, simple people who are not discussing <laughs> sustainability issues in that sense, because they live, it's part of their their history and part of their journey. Amazing. I think this is such a wonderful way to end the conversation. And I'm feeling very energized, very inspired, and um, also just, yeah, really full to the brim with the, the insights and stories that you have all told. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, I hope that if you attended, you also really enjoyed it. And somebody said in the chat, it's been a very amazing and thought provoking session. And I totally agree. So yeah, thank you so much to all the panelists, um, everybody that attended, and I hope that we take this conversation into our own homes, our own friendship circles, our own communities, and continue the conversations and work there. Um, and yeah, wishing you all a great rest of your week.